to another very interesting discussion at the Eco Arts and Literary Festival. Um, this year, as you've noticed from our program, those of you who've been here for, for since yesterday, we have, uh, of course, this was also the case last year and the year before, but this year we particularly have been engaging with the topic of food quite closely. Um, Kavri was here last year and spoke about food as well. But this year, one of the reasons we've been talking about food as much as we have is because we've had the privilege of having Naomi Dugrid with us. And um, I, I'm really looking forward to today's discussion. Uh, Naomi is one of the more interesting, I would say, important writers on culture today. Um, and her, as her way of writing about culture is writing about food. Her books are unfortunately um, not on sale, but I urge you to look them up on the internet, find them, uh, uh, find, follow her on the internet and find out more about them because they're very, very important. They cover different regions of the world, including India. They also follow topics. They're a blend of scholarship, of uh, memoir, of travelogue, and of recipes, they're, and of wonderful photographs. They're, they're really remarkable. Very pleased to have her with us, Naomi Dugut. Also, we have with us Kavri Ponapa, who is the author of a marvelous book, which is a kind of a, uh, a museum in a book, which is called The Vanishing Kodavas. It's available in the library here, if you'd like to take a look at it. It's a cultural study of the Kodava people. Uh, that's the people of Kurg, which is uh, one of the great pockets of uh, a unique civilization in India. Um, Kavri also writes about food, and uh, she has a, a blog, a wonderful blog, called the Kurg Table that documents the food history and traditions of the Kodavas. Um, to moderate that session today, we were meant to have, and she might still show up, Fatima Silva Gracious, who, as you know, is a great scholar of the, and uh, uh, what should I say, ambassador for the cuisine in the Goa, which is the food culture that arose in Goa over the course of the last 500 years since colonialism, but she's not here. So for a few minutes, I will join the conversation, uh, perhaps and kick it off. So, food and identity, very important to all of us. Um, in the case of the Goans, uh, I've uh, written about this previously. If you go just a few kilometers to the north, which is a place, say to a place called Malvan, which is very well known also for its food. The food uh, culture is based on primary ingredients which are derived from the region. You have a spectacular fresh seafood. You have ingredients like uh, mango and kokum and uh, tamarind and the ingredients that grow there. Um, and it is a brilliant cuisine. It is, a, it is a cuisine that that has largely not been, um, that has largely not undergone a process of globalization. And that food identity um, is quite distinct from what has happened to Goa. In Goa, the food cultures, and this, this extends uh, across the table really, I mean, uh, not, not just metaphorically, includes influences from Africa, from the Middle East, from South America, uh, from Southeast Asia. Many of the dishes which we consider iconic, the Goan dessert, bebinka, is a version of a Southeast Asian dish called bebinka. Um, uh, feijoada is something that's also made and, uh, iconically in Brazil. Vindalu, um, uh, sorbatel, or any, any dish. And of course, Indian culture, Indian, Indian food traditions changed drastically due to what happened here in Goa which is chilies, potatoes, corn, tomatoes, um, all these products came in here. And so the food identity here kind of changed also. Um, I'm curious as to what your thoughts are, perhaps we'll start with Kavari here, is to what extent, I, th I think that the, f the food of Goa does represent what happened to the culture, culture of Goa. I'm curious to what extent you feel that the food traditions of Kurg represent the historical trajectory and also the cultural tra trajectory of the Kodavas. Um, if 
if I look at Kork vis-a-vis Goa, the first thing that strikes me is that how closed the place is. It doesn't have, uh, it is just about 60 miles away from the sea, but it it is completely mountainous, hilly terrain. And uh, if you look at our history and if you look at our cultural identity, it has been completely shaped by this landscape. This landscape of a very um, dense forest, abundant game, um, a lot of freshwater fish, and this tremendous um, abundance of raw materials, which are very similar to uh, Malnad in the north and Wainad in Kerala in the south. But the way the people have stamp their identity and personality onto this landscape is completely different. You have a unique set of dishes, uh, a unique way of cooking food and using ingredients um, and you know, sort of translating and interpreting them into food. Uh, not that we were, I was speaking with Naomi just before this, uh, the big picture of, um, uh, you know, uh, big world events that were taking place, the landing of the Portuguese and trade with Myanmar, meant that some of these ingredients managed to find their way into Kul, into Kul cuisine. We, we have uh, bird's eye chilies which are referred to as paringe moru, as in firangi chilies. Or you have um, pineapples which are called paringi chekke, which is uh, their interpretation, um, jackfruit, but Firangi jackfruit. So you do have a trickle of, um, you know, ingredients which came in, but I think the food managed to uh, retain its identity because of the landscape. It was so closed. I turned it on. Oh, there it is. Um, well, and uh, when I when I talked to you. One of the things that I've about briefly was uh, okay. Uh, sorry, okay. Um, was uh, was kokum because kokum is here and in and in Kerala and used as a piece as a souring agent. But in Cork, between the two almost between Goa and Kerala, uh, kokum is processed and used in an entirely was used to sour. But you do all sorts of different things with it and you transform it into something completely other. And that's a, a remarkable thing. And yet the neighbors don't do that at all. Um, and that's a, that's an identity. Now we're getting down to specifics before talking about the general, but it's sometimes really interesting to go to the specifics in order to see, uh, to then talk about the general. So can you talk a little about, about that, that uh, what you call it and, and also uh, what you, how you work with it, because it's really remarkable. Yes, this is, this is um, uh, what you call kokum and what we call uh, panapuri. We call it panapuri. Um, but what we do is that we wait for the fruit to ripen and we put it out into the sun in these wicker baskets and we allow it to, uh, the heat of the sun to break it down. And you have these earthenware pots underneath and you collect the juices and you um, boil it and it thickens and it darkens and you basically have something like, I believe it's technically not a vinegar, but it's uh, used as a vinegar. So this is a thickening agent and it also has, it's a souring agent, it's normally added right at the end of a, a curry or a dish or it's used as a marinade. Uh, but it's also got a number of medicinal properties which are um, you know, now being forgotten because <coughs> My grandmother and my mother-in-law, would, uh, if any of the children of the house develop mumps, uh, they would actually smear it on under your ears, and it it had medicinal properties which helped. Uh, so kachapuri is one of these kind of um, ingredients which we use very differently from our neighbors north and south. Um, but I think what I'd really like to say. Um, uh, since it is about food and identity, if I look at my part of the world, and I'm sure that if you look at you, where you come from, it'll be not too different. Um, we created a distinct, a very distinct food identity over the centuries, and we managed to sustain this because it was our response to the landscape. 
um, choices in how you grow and procure food. And for us, it was rice cultivation and hunting. Uh, Korwas were outstanding hunters. Um, and it was very interesting to see that despite the fact that they had these vast, untamed acres and teeming wildlife, the hunt was sacred. So you hunted according to very specific rules. You didn't hunt during particular seasons. Uh, that itself, this huge respect that you had for the landscape, you literally held it sacred. You created very compact communities which were very interdependent and uh, there was a collective responsibility for um, making sure that no one was hungry. Uh, this might sound very, uh, very simple, but if you see where we are now, uh, you can see what a long distance we've traveled because everybody participated in the harvest. You built a community and this big we feeling um, because when, uh, for instance, when we harvested rice in the past, um, it was not good enough to send um, labor to help your neighbor. You had to go yourself. You had to help him work his fields and harvest the, the crop. And then at the end of it, you, you shared and you ate together and you problem solved together. So this um, very compact, community attitude towards food and what you were cooking and eating, that remained intact for the better part of our history. Um, and when the changes came, they initially came gradually. Um, the first changes came, I think, in the 17th century when we had um, a lot of political turmoil and um, Kul began to be ruled by Lingayat kings who, were, who came from outside Kogu. So the one concession that they made was um, they stopped eating beef uh, in deference to their Lingayat kings. Because Korvas ate everything. They ate uh, wild buffalo and turtle and monkey and whatever they might say now. We actually ate everything. Uh, the, the next traumatic change came in 1834. That was when the Kalu powers came in and coffee plantations came to cook. And our entire food identity changed because you suddenly, the, the community was, uh, became less important and the individual identity in food was born. Uh, I'd like to say a little bit more about this, but we the afternoon. Please. Well, I, I just think it's really interesting because now it's just the two of us talking and this is kind of freeing in a way. I get to interview you and learn so much, and aren't you happy that we're learning all this? But so that also changed things into a cash economy because people were being paid for the coffee. Uh, yes, in fact, this was a, a drastic change. So you, because yeah, you're no longer growing for food. You're you're, you're growing to make money, money, and then you're going to spend the money on what? Well, um, and on outside goods, presumably. Well, there were some amusing things that happened, um, some not so amusing things. The first thing that happened was. Uh, we suddenly had a small elite and this was for the first time in our history because we had a very democratic uh, society until then because there was so much of arbitration and consensus before anything was decided. And one of the ways that this little elite expressed their difference was through food. And uh, you suddenly had uh, cakes and biscuits and roasts coming onto certain tables, cutlery, crockery, and um, a lot of, uh, you know, they distanced, they, they made a conscious effort to distance themselves from village foods, rustic foods. So no one, we have a very special yam that um, it sort of, it's, it peaks at the time of our rice harvest and it's actually called, Putari is the name for the rice harvest. It's called Putari Kalsi, which is the Putari yam. So that is something you look forward to. It's not particularly wonderful to eat, but you eat it with sugar and sweeten it up. But it was such a part of our food identity. And then suddenly you had these people who, uh, you know, they, they were very British and they didn't want to eat this. 
um, and they stopped, they distanced themselves from these kind of foods. They were considered, you know, rustic in, the, in a very negative sense. Um, and also, this was something which was really not documented at the time, but we lost a lot of foods in that period. The, the habit of foraging, for instance, for wild leaves and berries and fruits. Um, the people who lived in the villages continued these <coughs> traditions, but then you had this um, sort of snobbery towards certain kinds of foods and creating a new food culture, really. So that, that really, t oops, here we are, uh, that really takes us to that whole question of food and identity, you know, within your own community. Um, people use food, and we see this now in social media. I mean, it expresses itself in every era and in every part of society. People use food to stamp who they are <coughs> and to, as you say, distinguish themselves from their neighbors. You know, I eat pork and she doesn't. Um, she eats beef and I don't. Um, and then I eat only the fancy things and they eat the grubs and you know all of those things that there's all these and then you know this person eats with their hands and I of course I wouldn't eat with my hands I only eat with chopsticks and and so on um, and these are all these are all markers um, they're markers of status sometimes but sometimes they're just also uh, uh, what's the word basically a it's, it confirms identity in terms of community. They glue together. They mark the line between the insider and the outsider, right? And so it's very interesting to think about food and identity in a community where, which is having incomers. For example, in Goa, where there's been a coming and going of different peoples, and you have different communities. Of course, they distinguish themselves by what they eat, but also that's shifting as new foods are coming in. And as people's status changes, perhaps somebody gets some money because they become a trader, well then what does that do inside their family food culture, right? So interesting. And where I uh, live in Toronto, uh, we are a, we're a country of immigrants. There were, there were and there still are um, descendants of the Aboriginal, original communities, the original people, but Canada's largely a country of immigrants. And you know, immigrants that come as refugees, immigrants come who come by choice in various ways, and they have the job of defining themselves when they arrive. And they partly want to figure out how to belong to this new place, but they also don't want to lose track of who they are, because there's nothing more dislocating than leaving home, especially if you've been forced out by war. So you want to hold on to something. And it's the, what people hold on to and what they leave behind, most often they hold on to food. And they hold on to the food that you have to feed the baby, for example, because that's associated with identity and, and sort of safety and health. And then they hold on to the food that you eat at ceremonial occasions, because again, those are markers that are community markers, right? But they might, in the middle of the week, be eating it was such a it was such a part of me, and I, I just had to take these along. And um, subsequently, I did cook a great deal of cool food, which I think uh, I think all our friends, British and French and Dutch, and they all ate the food, and we actually worked our way back into uh, my culture through that food because everybody knows tandoor butter chicken and you know tandoori but nobody knew about cook back in the 80s uh, but to answer your question we did have a huge influx uh, what you said was very very uh, notionally enclosed but uh, we we lost the bulk of our population in and yes, the In the wars with uh, Tipu and Haider, uh, practically all the population of Kulik was wiped out. So the land is actually repopulated. Uh, the, the Raja of Kulik, when he escaped from captivity, he came back and he sent these raiding parties down to Mangalore and Mysore and literally rounded up people and brought them back and repopulated Kulik. So they just took on the old clan names or they were given new clan names and they 
they literally started a community again. Um, so you find from that period there are, um, you know, little traces of Mangalorean food, like near dosas. We make them in Kolk as well, and um, uh, you know, the influences which have been, which have come in and have been accepted, and they've been made part of our cuisine. Um, as far as um, eating with people is concerned, I, I really, uh, the Kuns are a very open community. They, they accept anyone at their table. In fact, if you're ever stranded in um, Koriku, you will likely, if you meet a cook and you sort of tell them that what, whatever's happened to you, you're likely to be invited home. Uh, there are no restrictions on people we share our food with. In fact, there's a very interesting um, 18th century um, text which has specific rules for the treatment of travelers and strangers. Uh, all the village headmen were compelled to offer them a room for the night, food, uh, and they were very specific, chicken and eggs. <laughs> so the hospitality was there for everyone. I think we should open this to questions now, don't you? Because aren't you interested in all this? And aren't there things you want to know? I'm doing it a little early in the session, but I think it's a good idea. Uh, um, so I'm going to pass this. It's okay, I okay. Okay. Can you stand up then and talk loudly? How did folk uh, come to play such an important role in the foodie diet? And another question: uh, What kind of a role do uh, men play in the kitchen? So the questions are, how did pork come to play such an important role in the diet of the people of Kork, and what is the role of men in the kitchen? Um, pork, uh, Kork was, as I said, very, very densely forested, so we had huge amounts of wild game. And wild boar was, uh, wild boar was actually a menace, because they root. And when you plant your crops, they, they come and they sort of destroy the crops. Um, so you, during the uh, time when your rice crop was sort of maturing, you always had these little lookouts and uh, wild boar was fair game. But uh, I think it's, I mean, each, each community has um, taste preferences and course, we ate everything. We ate venison and, um, as I said, uh, a certain type of monkey, turtles, but pork was really the heart of uh, Korva cuisine. And um, your second question about what role men play, uh, I think you might find it interesting that all the heavy duty work at weddings until catering to Korva was always done by men. And uh, many of the feasts were cooked by men. Um, and women, of course, manage the kitchens and uh, for the ancestral homes and the extended joint families. But they never hesitated in helping out. Uh, and the men were also pretty good cooks because they hunted. And there are a lot of lost recipes which I'm trying to uh, retrieve, where they would set off on a hunt and all they carried was salt and those famous pirangi chilies and uh, rice. And when they shot, uh, you first had to make an offering to the god of the hunt after you'd skinned the animal and you roasted uh, maybe a liver or uh, some part of the animal. And then you uh, cut cross sections of bamboo and you filled it with rice and water and salt and meat and chilies and you, you already had a fire going so you had these hot um, sort of uh, mud or sand or embers and you buried it and you went away and you finished the rest of your hunt and you had a ready cooked meal when you were back. So the men were quite good. Uh, and then, uh, yes, if you could stand up and speak loudly and then maybe I'll repeat the question too. Yeah, that was a very interesting discussion and uh, my question is a slightly uh, macro one. I mean, uh, you spoke about isolation and could be mountainous and um, I think that's um, uh, the selective forces uh, for you know the evolution of food diversity is very similar to those of uh, species evolution in a way. And I'm wondering if there's been any sort of a meta-analysis or a large-scale analysis looking at you know a change in biodiversity across time, you know, with food uh, diversity. Any comments on that? Because I would believe that the the sort of pressures of extinction and 
evolution are very similar, you know, it's isolation, distance from, you know, I mean, um, globalization, you could say, or, you know, whatever else. Has there been anything of this sort done? Can you hear at the back? Would you hear that? Okay. Um, I'm, I'm going to try and answer this question about um, the pressures of, um, you know, Um, it's, it's a really important topic um, in, in, uh, where we've had this very generous biodiversity. Uh, one of the most shocking changes that we've seen in the last, um, I would say from the 1980s onwards, is this tremendous monoculture of silver oak which has swamped our coffee plantations. Uh, you previously, um, people grew coffee and you sh grew shade trees. Uh, many of them were ficus or fruit trees, oranges or you know local varieties of trees. Um, and then, uh, I, I maybe I'm sort of um, well, I might as well say it because when in the 1980s, when uh, Tata Coffee took over the uh, what used to be the old consolidated coffee. Um, they began timber extraction. So uh, for the first time people began selling trees. Earlier people would cut trees if they needed to build a house and they needed um, um, frameworks for their win frames for their windows and doors. And, and suddenly they realized that there was a lot of money in timber. So now you have this devastating side of seeing a complete monoculture of silver, silver oak all over coke. And the same thing has happened to our foods. Um, as, uh, again, we were discussing this earlier about how right up to my mother-in-law's generation, everyone had kitchen gardens where you grow, um, you know, squashes and beans. And so you had your basic um, vegetables from local strains of sea. And now you find that kitchen kitchen gardens have disappeared and you are buying vegetables. So it's I don't know honestly there is we do have a few research station and generally and they do a fair bit of research. I'm not sure whether this has been studied as an issue. It's a very important one and one of huge concern uh, to all of us who live who you know who have land there. And there's a question here in the front. Uh, actually, I sell papers that we really settled in Goa. So I don't know whether I'm a Tibetan or a Goan. I have a Tibetan friend. The same way regarding the food. Okay? The moment they say I'm a Tibetan, they say Idli Sambar. Okay? But my children hate that. Huh? They love Pau Bhaji or bread. For me, bread is like in our place. If we have bread, only if you're sick. <laughs> so there's a big side So how do, you, how do I wish to solve it with my children? Because I don't know the answer. Okay. Um, <laughs> this, is, this is really a tough one. Um, I, I'll try and tell you what I did with our children because um, but, but what you say is very important because food is so much a part of your identity and you know how you express yourself and who you are. Uh, we we lived, um, one of the reasons I came back to India, I said we'd gone away to India, is because I wanted to bring up our children here. Uh, but we lived, we couldn't live in Kul. We lived in Mumbai and then in Bangalore and then the children went away to different schools. But I tried my best to cook uh, the food that my grandmother and my mother and my aunts and my mother-in-law cooked, uh, if not every day. Um, maybe a couple of times a week or when they came home for the holidays uh, just to tell them this is where you came from so you could uh, if I were you I'd give my, I'd give my children multiple identities why not so the same way we, uh, what we do when we make fish curry in our place we used to have uh, tomato and onion but here it is coconut which is unthinkable in our place so we used to think that if we put coconut and fish together, we'll have stomach upset. Oh, definitely. But after coming to Goa, even in Kerala, so coconut is a must for fish curry. So this is uh, the cultural difference which I find 
uh, it has got, maybe it is because of the coconut trees. Sure. So there are coconuts are available. So and in our place we don't have coconuts. So whatever the available ingredients, accordingly our uh, curries also differ. You're absolutely right. And in fact, in, in Korg itself, where we now use a fair bit of coconut in our food, I somehow feel that there was a time when coconuts were not that freely available because it doesn't grow that easily and naturally. And uh, there are records of uh, one of the kings, um, you know, he, he traded uh, a territory with uh, Mangalore to make sure that there was a regular supply of coconuts to Talakaviri. So that means it could not have been so easily available at one time. So um, I think your children are lucky they have multiple food identities. But, but the other thing is when you say, well, for you it would be tomato and onion. Well, there weren't tomatoes here before the you know, 16th century. So in fact, I wonder what the souring agent was before. There was a taste for sour, for acidity. Was it tamarind? Was it kokum? What, you know, and why, why was it that, well, it was something less effective or something like the color of tomato? I mean, these, these shifts that are so interesting, so that you, you, your identity continues, but how it's expressed has shifted because of a new ingredient, because of a new idea, because of a new fashion, perhaps. I mean, who knows? But um, it's, it's really interesting. And I have a household where it's not so much that struggle, but there's people who eat different things and who don't eat other things, and that's tiresome. So we always eat, um, you know, it's sort of a really Indian style. In other words, a, there's a pot of rice, uh, there may or may not be bread, and then three or four other dishes. And I'm never good, I never fought with my children about it. I'd just say, well, I knew there was rice and one thing, like dal, that they'd eat. And if they didn't like the other things on the table, I didn't care. And it's really great. If you don't care, your children are much more likely to eat than if you do care. I mean, can we talk about this? Because I think it's, you know, I, there's a lot of nods happening in the front here. Um, it, it's, it's really important, and it, and it is about, if it's about identity, we do want to transmit a comfort with food and an appreciation and, and, a, res, and a respect. But if food is a battleground, it doesn't, it means that children don't respect it, it becomes a battleground, it's just not useful. So, going sort of back to your question, but extending it, I think it's really important that some of to care enough to make to make food with care and with respect and all of that and be attentive to who's coming to the table. But once they're there, let them be. And you know, frankly, let them starve. If they don't want to eat that delicious thing you've made and they only want to eat rice and dal, which is the case with one of my children, well, more for me. I mean, you know, I, I'm just not gonna worry about it. Instead of and I insisted that they have a taste. But then after that, uh, you know, no, no fights. And it's really wonderful because now they're grown and they're still, we're completely relaxed at the table and there's no echo of, of earlier arguments. And so I'm just, I know I'm sounding, I'm just momming all of you and giving you all, um, what's the word, uh, parenting advice. But it's truly important and I think with, it's not just with kids, um, but anytime you're trying to get somebody to sort of try something, which I'm doing quite a lot, I wrote a book about Burma. I'm saying to people, well, gosh, try this, it's so interesting. But I don't, I try not to say that too much. I just say, well, there's this and this, and you might like this. And then I try to be really not care, you know, to not be invested in their wanting it or liking it. Because, and, and to not see somebody's refusal of my food as a refusal of me, which of course is the thing at play with your children as well, right? When they say, you've put all this effort into the fish curry, and they say, but I don't like it with tomato and onion. I mean, that's a rejection. And we have to learn that it's not. It's just the child asserting an independence or whatever. They're not rejecting you. They just don't like <laughs> tomatoes and onions. Sorry, you had something to no, say. No, I think it's, it's something from one of Naomi's books, and I thought I'd read it out to you. I, I wrote it down because I liked it so much. Uh, she um, she writes, we sometimes laugh when we think about the food we eat at home. It's as unlike the food we eat growing up as any could possibly be. And I think that that is, I think what that should happen. They want McDonald's, fries, and uh, expensive meat they have
uh, if they want, the question is, what happens when the children want, we are into parenting discussion here, but that is about food and identity. Uh, what happens when they want McDonald's uh, fries, pizza, rather than any food they have at home? Let them earn the money to go buy those things. I'm not interested in, in supporting those, and if they want to, that's their problem. Um, but I also think that an absolute interdiction of anything just turns it into something more desirable. So the sort of every once in a while um, doing that is, is a way also of soft, of, of making it less mysteriously wonderful. You know, so it's a bit of a balancing act. And there's another question here. Yeah, this is sort of uh, more to a larger view. You know, food is a, I think I'm quoting someone here who I can't remember. Uh, food is... The food is a uh, lens through which to view world history and culture. Yeah, and uh, I, there have been some histories written about uh, written about food. Uh, I particularly remember when I can't remember the old. Uh, Acharya. You mean, oh, food, oh, Rhea Tannehill. Rhea Tannehill. But it's not a history of the food, food. It's about the history of how food affects the current event. I was actually wondering if there are any books which actually view the history of either countries or the world in the central vision of food and agriculture. Yes, there's a, there's a book that's very recent by Rachel Lauden, L-A-U-D-A-N. It's called Cuisine and Empire. And it came out uh, last year or perhaps the year before. And it's uh, published by the University of California Press. And it's very good. Um, and she's a historian. She's trained as a philosopher. And she's then become a food historian. And uh, she's English but lives now in the States. Um, she, she lived for quite a while in Hawaii and then in Mexico. She sort of moved around. And um, she's married to a philosopher. Um, and it's very interesting. She, that's what she does, is she tracks. Uh, you'd find it interesting, quite different from Rhea Tannehill. And she talks about, well, cuisine and empire. So that really does tell you very much. So she's not tracing small communities. She's tracing the larger, you know, when famines cause civil war and so on. And, you know, the Arab Spring, for example, is caused by, partly, by expensive food expense and, and climate change and uh, those kinds of disasters. So those, those things she tracks through time, going back to the means of Persians. Hope that's helpful. What are we doing for time? We're out of time. Um, okay. One question. This is not much of a question than as an observation as, as uh, we were going through the conversation. I'm uh, Tulu and we are famous for the Udupi cuisine and my kids are brought up in Goa, my husband is Maharaj Prem. But what I found very interesting is they will experiment with everything and when in crisis and I know they are really really in need of comfort, they go back to the traditional Odupi cuisine cooked in coconut oil, you know, and I found that really amazing. And it's not just this, I've had a lot of other uh, kids also saying that that particular smell, because it reminded them of their home, their grandmother's kitchen, and it's not the mother's kitchen, it's the grandmother's kitchen, and that was the comfort zone. That was quite amazing. Well, now I hear that from my kids' friends who's, who have come themselves or their parents have come from various parts of the world and um, to Toronto, and I ask them what happens when they're sick, what do they yearn for, or when they're feeling low or vulnerable. And it's, it's some version of, as, it, as the European version would be chicken soup, you know, but some version of grandmother comfort food. Um, my, my comfort food is rice with a fried egg on top, you know, and, and, and greens. It's not what I grew up with, but it's, uh, you know, I'm old enough that I've developed my own comfort food, and it's really, uh, and we all have those things, and there, it's a very interesting question always to ask someone. You get to know, and this is uh, food as a way of knowing culture, you can understand often where someone might have come from when you talk to them about their comfort foods. It's a, it's a really lovely way to start a conversation in a bar or anywhere. Uh, thanks, everybody, for your patience. Thank you so much.
Kauri, and Naomi for that excellent session. Food as Identity. I urge you both to follow both their writings on the internet and also look for Naomi's books. They're quite wonderful. Uh, uh, some of them are also available as e-books. Do get them. They're invaluable documents. Thank you so much, both of you. Please keep your seats for the next session, Intersections, Literature, Art and Aesthetics with Anjum Hassan, Saikat Majumdar and Arun Kopka. Thank you so much, Naomi and Kaveri.